Woody spends a lot of the movie not trying to do anything. On the first night, he spends all day binge-watching Woody's Roundup, where he was presumably told many times of the importance of looking out for your friends. During this time, he wasn't trying to do anything. He also knows that it will take a long time to get back to Andy's house, and that he has to be there before Andy gets home. The entire plotline with Utility Belt Buzz doesn't really go anywhere. Buzz doesn't learn anything from it, since he is capable of going from Al's toy barn to Al's apartment all on his own, and he treats everyone else exactly the same. It also doesn't have an impact on Woody, since the misunderstanding is cleared up before Woody even leaves Al's apartment. This film has a very clear theme of how important it is to make a child happy. Once upon a time, there was a toy named Woody. Every day, he was played with by Andy. But one day, Al McWiggin kidnaps him. Because of that, he is introduced to Jesse, Bullseye, and Stinky Feet. Because of that, he realizes that Andy is growing up. Until finally, he convinces Jesse and Bullseye to come with him and be played with. The relevant characters are Woody, Buzz, Jesse, Bullseye, Stinky Pete, Al, Andy's other toys, Utility Belt Buzz, and Zerg. This is a large number of characters, and as I explained in point two, Utility Belt Buzz and Zerg can simply be cut. Woody is placed in an opposite environment, but it is not in the way that you might think. Throughout the first film, Woody was neurotic and impulse-driven, while all the other characters acted as calm voices of reason. In this movie, Jesse is even more neurotic than Woody, so he now has to act as the calm voice of reason. The ending is that Woody is back in Andy's room and being played with. While this may sound like a good ending, it is exactly where Woody was at the beginning of the movie before his arm ripped. Having Jesse and Bullseye with him, or knowing that he was the star of a TV show, doesn't really have any impact on his personality. This film was completely and totally rewritten during its development history, and was written, storyboarded, and produced in only nine months. Woody was convinced to go back to Andy's after deciding to go to the museum because he saw himself on Woody's Roundup. This doesn't work because he already watched the entire series. This was released at a good time because the children who viewed it at its release are now becoming teenagers and playing with toys less. In point 8, I explained how this movie wasn't put on paper until it was way too late to do any significant rewrites. This movie was originally going to be a direct-to-video musical, since that is what Disney was used to. However, they made a good decision to not do that, as doing that would have prioritized profit over good storytelling. Woody is convinced to leave Andy and go to the museum after one day with the Roundup Gang. The only things that he thought about were the fact that Andy is growing up and the fact that Jesse, Bullseye, and the Prospector need him to get into the museum. He never thought about Buzz or Bo Peep or anything else. Also, when he changes his mind and decides to go back to Andy, it is because he saw himself singing You've Got a Friend in Me on Woody's Roundup, even though he presumably binge-watched the entire series the night before. This story was not set up in the first film.
This is largely a retread of point 13, but if I were Woody deciding whether to go to the museum, I would think. Andy is only around 8 to 10 years old at this point, so I still have a lot of playtime with him, and I still have Buzz and Bo Peep and all the other toys for company. Also, museum exhibits don't last forever, and I would spend a lot of time in storage. It is never explained why the museum is only interested in a complete set. We know that Woody is very rare, a lot rarer than the other toys, and therefore very hard to find, so it isn't very reasonable for the museum to expect Al to have Woody just because he has all of the other toys and merchandise. Also, the museum could still make a lot of money off of the collection without Woody, so overall it just seems like a bad business decision. Woody being a collectible was something that was present in the first draft of the first movie. The fact that they were still able to take information from the first draft of the first movie is a great example of this rule. Woody's final test was to rescue Jesse and Bullseye from Stinky Pete. However, Woody is already fully prepared and motivated to do it, as we saw in Al's apartment, which was a low-stakes environment. Also, Buzz and the other toys have to rescue Woody before Woody can rescue Bullseye and Jesse. It sure is convenient that the Pizza Planet truck happens to be outside Al's apartment complex, and that Buzz, Mr. Potato, Ed Ham, Slinky, and Rex know how to drive it despite never having driven a car before. The building block of Woody as a collectible was originally derived from the unproduced TV special A Tin Toy Christmas. This is not as identifiable with as the first film, as the film implies that toys are immortal, but humans are not immortal. The essence of this movie is that Woody learns that he's famous, and then realizes that Andy is growing up, which causes Woody to want to be placed in a museum, but then he changes his mind in the end. There's a large amount of the movie that isn't relevant to this, such as the entire character of Stinky Pete.